All right, let's open our Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 1. We're moving rather slowly, getting off to a slow start in the book of Hebrews. This is the third or fourth week. We're still on the first few verses here. And uh, before we jump into it, I was thinking of this after our church service earlier today. And I meant, maybe I meant to say some of these things in the sermon, which I didn't get to, but God, a balanced, God being a balanced being means that he, he has certain uh, limitations to his own nature. That is, God doesn't interfere with your free will. He granted man the, the power to make decisions, to either choose to obey God. The funny thing is, God started out with a man and the woman in the garden, and he gave, he gave them only one rule. Let's see how they handle that. One rule, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of the garden. Let's see if they can just avoid that one tree. And uh, now, in order to make it a, a valid uh, a choice, he had to at least make the, the tree uh, appealing and pleasant. I mean, if it looked like, you know, it's full of prickly thorns and stuff, who would want to get near that anyway? Especially if you're walking around the, in the garden with no clothes on. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. But, but if he made it unappealing and unattractive, they wouldn't touch it. So he had to, he had to make it appear uh, pleasant to the eyes, a, a knowledge of a fruit to be desired, to make one wise, and so forth. And they couldn't, they couldn't obey that one rule. They failed. And um, there was a guy about, a hundred and, about 1875, a, man, a, a poet in England wrote a, a verse called Invictus. His name was William Henley. And it's only about four stanzas, but it's sort of become the rallying cry of skeptics and atheists since that time. Uh, Mr. Henley had lost a leg of amputation through some, because of some disease and was in danger of having the other one uh, amputated. But uh, Dr. Lister, who was experimenting in those days with uh, human anti uh, antiseptics and so forth, and his name became an eponym called, uh, we use it today, in the product Listerine. It's an antiseptic, or a mouthwash in that case. But he treated uh, Mr. Henley uh, with multiple surgeries and was able to save, to keep, prevent him from losing that second leg. But this man was obviously angry with God. He was upset and depressed and wanted to blame God for the predicament that he was in. And so in his poem, Invictus, the last stanza says, It matters not uh, how straight the gate, how, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. In essence, I don't need God. And if there are any gods out there, I'll take my chances with them. I'm responsible for my own actions. I'm responsible for my successes or my failures. And God and the d divine intervention of God has nothing to do with it. And that last phrase has sort of become, a, like I say, a, a rallying cry for agnostics and skeptics and so-called free thinkers and atheists, uh, they say that I'm responsible, I have my free will, but when somebody else's free will causes harm to someone else, the atheist then says, why doesn't your God of love step in and stop that from happening? They can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, here's how the atheist reasons. Every atheist reasons this same way. They all, at one time or another, come up to the same uh, proposition. You Christians believe that your God is a God of love. You, you believe your God is a God who is omniscient. He knows everything. And he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. If so, why is there so much suffering in the world? Why does God let that go on? Uh, either God doesn't know about it. He's unaware that some suffering is taking place. Somebody's 
doing, uh, causing uh, uh, inhumanity to man somewhere in the world. So if he's not aware of that event, then he's not all-knowing. If he does know about it and doesn't stop it, maybe he's not a god of love after all. If he doesn't, if he knows about it uh, but can stop it, then he's not all-powerful. You know, they say if he knows about it and he could do something about it but doesn't do anything about it, then he's not a god of love. This is how every atheist reasons wants to argue against the Christian who believes in God. But the argument they, they propose should be stopped in its tracks from before they ever utter another a single word of it. Because you cannot find fault with someone who doesn't exist, can you? There's an old phrase, yesterday upon the stair, I met a man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. See, the problem is up here. The problem is up here in the atheist. He wants to find fault because, he, first of all, he says there is no God. There is no need for the divine. There's no need for some supernatural intervention. There's no need. We don't believe in the miraculous. We don't believe in any God. We simply believe in the material world. But when the material world falls to pieces or people commit harm and hurt other people, then they say it's God's fault. You can't have it both ways. You cannot find fault in someone who you maintain doesn't exist. The problem's in your mind. But let's suppose, you see, if when the atheist says, your Christian's belief, you believe that God sat by, and uh, Christopher Hitchens would do it this way, he would, in, in a public debate, he would actually cross his arms to emphasize his point. Your God sits by with folded arms, and watches the Jews being persecuted at Auschwitz in the death camps during World War II and didn't do anything about it. He sat there idly by uh, and said, I wonder what's going on down there today. I wonder how that's working out. And then he tries to impugn the character of God because God didn't stop the Nazis from gassing hundreds of thousands, even millions of Jews in, not, in concentration camps. Because God didn't stop it. They say God is indifferent. Well, let's, and because God doesn't step in, and stop every time someone's going to hurt someone else or kill someone else or rape someone else or maim someone else or cause devastation to someone else's life. They say because God doesn't step in and stop that, he's indifferent to man's sufferings. But if God were to step in and stop every one of those things from happening, they would say God is intrusive into men's lives. Why doesn't he back off and let us learn from our own mistakes? You can't have it both ways, you hypocrites. It's all they are. It's all they are. You can't have it both ways. Either God doesn't exist at all, and the problem lies with in the hearts of men, or God does exist, but you can't impugn uh, character flaws to someone who's not there. And God has his own reasons for letting these things go, because God gave man a free will. They, they say, uh, I have my own free will, I make my own decisions, I'm in charge of my life. But then when tragedy happens, they want God to step in and deny that they have any culpability, that they had any free will that brought it about to start with. You can't have it both ways. We're not going to let you have it both ways. Nor will God let you have it both ways. So Mr. Henley's uh, poem in Victus, one of the stupidest uh, rhymes ever written uh, by, a, by a man. All right, now let's get to our lesson here in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, we dabbled in verse 2 for most of the time last week. But speaking of Christ, verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory, God's glory, and the express image of his person. Jesus Christ is the express image of God. Go back to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, and verses 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Lord Jesus Christ, you know something? Jesus Christ was the means through which or by which God created the universe. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
John chapter 1 tells us. So while the Bible begins, God in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, the New Testament informs us that it was by the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead, through which God the Father made the universe. The JW's mistaken idea is that God created Jesus, and then he let Jesus create everything else. That's not scripture at all. Jesus has been here since eternity past and will exist in eternity future. He had no beginning or end. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4, and uh, notice there verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Uh, the Lord Jesus told Philip, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. John 14, verse 9. He is all the physical uh, appearance of God any sinner needs to see. I've never seen, I didn't see Jesus in his physical earthly form when he walked the streets of uh, Judea in Jerusalem. I didn't see him. I have no idea what he looked like, nor does anyone else. They didn't have cameras in those days. So, um, but he said, he that has seen me hath seen the Father. If, unlike the stupid statement made by Joseph Smith about God being a mortal man and we'd see him and he looked just like us, the same size, height, weight, and so forth as we are, that idiotic statement by that country bumpkin, he had no idea what he was talking about. But if you and I were to see God in his pure essence, John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But let us suppose, um, and, and 1 John uh, 4 said, God is, or 1 verse 5 says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So let us suppose we were able to look at God, the brightest light you could conceive of in the universe would make the sun look like a small candle next to a blast furnace. So if you can imagine, listen, if you get too close to a blast furnace, which is, you know, melting steel or iron in some, in some uh, industrial setting, without wearing protective clothing, asbestos-lined clothing, gloves, goggles, face mask, and so forth, it'll burn you up. They have to have protective gear just to get close to it in order to clean it out or work on it, do what they do. They don't go up there in shorts and flip-flops, you know, and just and handle the material. So if you have to, a man has to have that kind of protection just to get close to some smelting pot, something that a Kaiser Steel used to have or anything else like that, then no mortal man could ever look upon God in his pure essence and survive. And live to tell the tale. You melt right there. You, you disintegrate right on the spot. And so with the person of Jesus Christ, he is the image of God. He was God taking on human form, God in human form, to identify with men, to give men something to look at in order to understand the, the attributes of God and to see the love of God displayed in the person of Jesus Christ. He became a man for our sake. But Jesus Christ is the image of God. Now, Adam was made in God's image, according to Genesis 1, 20. Said, Let us make man in our image. And that is why he's called the Son of God, in Christ's genealogy, Luke chapter 3. Verse 38, he was a direct creation of God, so he's called the Son of God. But he was made by God. Adam wasn't born like everyone after him was born. And then Christ is called the last Adam. But uh, they weren't identical. Turn, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
1 Corinthians 15. And verse 45 tells us, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The last Adam, that will be Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47, The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And uh, this is the basis for what Paul had just got finished writing just before this verse, just before these verses. Uh, back up and read verses 42 through 44. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, that's Adam's body. It is raised in incorruption. That's the glorified image Christ promises. It is sown in dishonor. That's Adam. It is raised in glory. That's Christ. It is sown in weakness. Adam's body. It is raised in power. Christ's body. It is sown a natural body. Adam. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Our text, verse 3 says, and upholding all things by the word of his power. You notice it's not a capital W word, like the modern translations of trying to make it a personal pronoun and somehow make it a, a reference to Christ himself. But it's a small w referring to the words, plural. Those things written and those things, uh, those spoken and written down. Notice the, the same thing over in chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. Chapter 4, uh, verses 12 and 13. For the word, little w, the word of God, is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. What does he mean, uh, his sight and uh, him with whom we have to do? Verse 13. Well, he means the word of God. The antecedent, the subject is verse 12, the word of God. We, we think of our Bible as, as sort of being an inanimate object, and, and I guess for all definition and purposes it is. And yet, I can't help but, but think that somehow, but God ass assigns to our Bible personal attributes. The Word of God is quick, that's an old English word, means alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. You know, you wouldn't understand the distinctions between soul and spirit unless you get your nose in the Bible. And that the joints and marrow, you understand that the soul is not attached to the body any longer. Once, it's, once you're saved, what's called a spiritual circumcision takes place, and that soul is loosed inside this body. It's not stuck to it. It, it, it dwells within the body. But, and it's the soul that makes these, and the soul and the spirit that make these bodies move and do what they do. Even an unsaved man's dead spirit is able to make this body move. Kind of like, uh, so when, when I talk to you, my soul is using this body and its vocal cords to communicate to you, and your ears are able, able to perceive what my voice is saying, and your soul is able to receive it. It's kind of like two people using the telephones. I was talking to him on the phone. Well, was he on the phone? No, you were using the phones as a means of communicating with each other. And so it is, you and I are living souls. And we use these bodies to converse and to communicate with one another. 
But it, you wouldn't understand those distinctions unless you got your nose into the Bible and began reading it, studying it, learning it. So he says, he describes human attributes to the written words of God. So it, it makes me wonder sometimes if, it says, all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Every religion offers people either a string of beads or a knotted rope to count their prayers. They offer them all kinds of trinkets, either a crucifix or a statue of the Buddha or a statue of some Hindu deity with a thousand arms springing out of it. Uh, you name it. Uh, every religion offers some sort of physical thing that is supposed to uh, trigger the, uh, the presence of God or bring you into God's presence by some means. But for the Christian, God gave us only one object to put our hands on. It's the book. That's it. This is the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And, and this Bible is able to read your mind. It, it, it's able to, by, by reading the stories of the different characters throughout the Bible, and their weaknesses, their strength, their, their, their heroic actions, their fearful and cowardly actions many times, you, you see those things, and all of those things can be applied to you. All of those attributes can be found in, in every human being to some measure or another. And this book tells you why you sin. This tells you the motives for your sin. This tells you why you want to do good once in a while because you can get away with it. Uh, this tells you why you're afraid of this, why you're angry at that. And you read about it and people don't like what they see because it's a mirror. It shows them. They see themselves in it. That's why uh, modern Christians want to get rid of our Bible and the, wor the unsaved world at large wants to get rid of all Bibles. Because the Bible exposes men's sins, it, it describes to them what they are. You know, you read the, the accounts of famous people in history. Great men, women of achievement, things that they did that made a great name for themselves in, in history books and in you know, American life or the, the life of any nation. And nearly all, almost universally, they sort of gloss over any bad behavior in that person's life, any wickedness, any time they spent in jail, any number of times they were arrested or received uh, citations from a police officer, they got tickets, they want to gloss over the fact that they didn't pay their income taxes, they, they stole from their job, they took things out of the office that didn't, blood. They, they sort of gloss over those things and accentuate the good that they, they see this person having done. But the Bible's not like that. The Bible gives you the full, unvarnished, unsugar-coated uh, truth about so many people's lives. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And so people read the Bible, and they get exposed to the Bible, they hear the Bible read to them or preached to them, and they don't like what they hear. I think a sodomite wants to read Romans chapter 1, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the due recompense for their error, which was meat, the wickedness or the sin, or rather the, 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 the consequences of their sin, uh, whether it be HIV, uh, AIDS, you know, syphilis, uh, venereal disease of any kind, God says that's meat, that's fitting, that's appropriate for what they've done. They bring it on themselves. Think somebody who's a two-pack-a-day smoker and a heavy drinker, wants to read uh, that your the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You know, if it's the temple of the Holy Ghost, a lot of Christians still think that it's okay to just drink and smoke and, and those things are between me and God. Um, they ignore verses like that because they don't want to be told uh, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap, Galatians 6, 7. People avoid the Bible once they get a sample of it, once it's been read to them, once they've heard it preached, once they've, once they've read it on their own a little bit, they want to close it up and ignore it and have nothing to do with it because it knows it has their number. The Bible has your number. It knows all about you, and it can discern the thoughts and the intents of your heart. It knows what's going on inside you. So it makes me wonder if sometimes the Bible's sitting on the, on the dining room table at my house, if it's not watching what's going on in my household. If it's not watching the actions of myself, my wife, my children, even our dog. 
makes you wonder how observant this book is of what's going on in your home. Now, that might be dressing it up a bit, but don't discount the possibility. It says, the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This book is the, the, this book is the person, if I can call it that, you're going to have to give an account for. If you've been given the Bible, you've enjoyed the, owning a Bible, maybe <laughs> several Bibles, then you're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ and answer as to how much Bible you ever learned or didn't learn. All of those things will be uh, made manifest in the judgment seat of Christ. But it says, the word of his power, verse, chapter 1, verse 3, the word of his power is the scriptures. I can't think of anything more powerful to break down the resistance of some stubborn, rebellious, sinful man. Lots of testimonies of bad men who got saved because they got exposed to the scriptures. They got exposed to something that the Bible had been warning about for generations and generations. Do I fully comprehend how the Bible governs the affairs of men the way it does? No, I can't say that I can fully comprehend it. But I, I can believe it because that's the inescapable conclusion you have to come to. Now, verse 3 also says, when he had by himself purged our sins. Turn back, if you will, to the book of St. John, the Gospel of John, chapter 10. John chapter 10, John 10, and one ver first of all, verse 11, Christ says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jump down there to verses 17 and 18. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Christ willingly listened to the mockery and the false accusations of the Jewish elders against him. He willingly was scourged at a whipping post because his flesh was raw and bloody. He willingly carried his cross, being in a weakened state. He carried it as far as he could till they employed, they employed the, the aid of someone else to carry it the rest of the way. And then he was nailed to it Stripped naked, exposed to public humiliation and disgrace, hung up on that cross, nailed to it through his hands and feet, had a crown of thorns pushed into his skull and blood running down his face, plus the, 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 the wounds having re he received from the scourging just earlier. Oh, he was a bloody mess on that cross. And he did it willingly. For the sake of sinners. And then he dies, and the spirit the soldier comes and thrusts a spear into the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did all of those things willingly, all for the sake of the sinner. Romans 5 8, I quoted it earlier today, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us knowing that after three days and three nights, he would be able to come back to life again. Now his mission is accomplished. Remember George Bush on the, on the deck of that one, a destroyer, or that aircraft carrier, uh, air, mission accomplished. We went into uh, Iraq. Mission wasn't accomplished. That was, a, that was a jump in the gun there, President 
George W. I like George Bush, but that was a little presumptuous and a little, uh, uh, I don't know, premature. The mission isn't accomplished yet. We still need to wipe out Islam where we can. I mean that in Christian love, of course, so don't get me wrong I'm watching on the internet. But uh, it says also, when he had by himself purged our sins, verse 3. That's one of the most anti-Catholic verses you can find. Christ has already purged my sins on the cross of Calvary. I don't have to wait and go to purgatory and have whatever sins are on my soul burned away in the fires of purgatory to make me worthy to go to heaven. Sort of a stopping off point, a halfway point, you know, a refueling uh, layover between here and Dallas. Or something. No, no, none of that. Christ has already purged my sins at the cross of Calvary. And the believers, uh, look back at Acts chapter 20. I mentioned this in our church hour. Acts chapter 20. And verse 28, Paul writes to the elders in Ephesus, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was the blood of God, in effect, being poured out for the sake of the sinner. It wasn't corrupt blood because Jesus had no earthly father. But it was the blood of God being shed for the sake of the sinner as punishment for the sinner's wickedness and his iniquities. Go forward now in our, in our book to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 22 there says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. And back up to verses 12 or 13 and 14, Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Christ not only purges the sin from your soul, but it also purges your conscience. It works on the body and it works on the mind. And it brings forth fruit. If you let it, you trust God to make something new out of you. you trust in Christ. But notice, um, it's not fire that purges the sinner, the sinner's sins from him. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's not the fires of purgatory. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. This qualifies the Bible as hate literature by so many people who don't like it. I mean, the Sodomites want to get rid of it. And the Roman Catholics want to get rid of it. They're not going to ask you to learn what to believe by studying. They're going to tell you what you need to believe. And the same thing with the political correctness. They don't want you to think for yourself. They'll tell you what to think. But the believer's purgatory is past tense. It's already done. Christ purged my sins, past, present, and future, by shedding his blood uh, in death on the cross of Calvary. And when I need forgiveness of my sins, uh, I, all I have to do is ask God that that forgiveness would cleanse me of the next sin I commit. God saves me, writes my name in heaven, and from that point on, I go back for, for new cleansing. If we confess our sins, John says, 1 John chapter 1, if we, believers, if we confess our sins, well, that's a sin committed by a Christian. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He cleansed my soul from its wickedness and stain of sin 
and made me a new creature in Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 5.17. But now he wants me to maintain that, purity, that purity, maintain fellowship with him by going back to him and asking him to forgive me one, yet again. I messed up today, God, I need forgiveness for that sin. God will do it. The idea that when I die, I have to go to some holdover place and the fires of purgatory will purge whatever sin is still holding onto my soul, hanging onto my spirit until I'm worthy to go to heaven. That's baloney. That's the belief of somebody who doesn't have any eternal security because they don't have any salvation. And lastly, it says he sat down on the right hand of God, or the right hand of the majesty on high. Look also at Hebrews 10. 10 and <laughs> verse 12. But this man, Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Amen. By the way, notice verse 12. The old uh, Catholic Douay Bible reads this way. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, comma, forever sat down on the right hand of God. They moved the comma back about eight spaces and changed the entire meaning of the verse. Because if he simply offered one sacrifice for sins, that Open, that, that leaves open the possibility that the, the Catholic priest can perform numerous sacrifices in the future. And then after he sa after offered one sacrifice for sins, he forever sat down at the right hand of God. They simply moved the comma, eight spaces, and changed the entire meaning of the verse. But if he forever sat down at the right hand of God, they have created a contradiction for themselves because the Apostles' Creed, every Catholic recites, says, from which, uh, he was seated at the right hand of God the Father, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Well, if he's forever seated at the right hand of, of God the Father, then he can't come back and judge anybody. So they create a contradiction when they start messing with the Bible. Mess with the Bible, God will mess with your mind, he'll mess with your theology, he'll mess with your whole denomination. Look back at chapter 1. We're just about finished. Chapter 1, verse 8. But unto the Son, he saith, this God saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Now that's going to find its ultimate fulfillment in the millennium and beyond. But in verse 8, God the Father calls Jesus the Son God. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now the JW Bible, and I was thinking of bringing one to class to, to read it to you, but the JW Bible says, um, God is your throne. Was it Jesus sitting on God's lap? Well, but imagine the picture, God is your throne, because they can't, they do not want to uh, give an inch and admit that their, Christ may possess deity just like God the Father, seated equally next to God the Father. So they say Jesus Christ is sitting on God's, on God, God's, the throne of Jesus Christ, which is a horrible sentence construction. It reads poorly. There, the JW Bible has got to be one of the biggest and most ridiculous renderings of the Bible ever published in the world. 